Good afternoon, AI community, and welcome back to Ray Summit by AnyScale. We are here in sunny San Francisco, California today. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be here with a full day of coverage on theCUBE. Now, we've talked a lot about AI applications across verticals and across industries. However, I don't think we've gotten to go into a super deep dive on what it means for drug discovery. Please in welcome, or join me in welcoming Stephen to the show. Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Hi, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's got to be a busy week. I can imagine you're having a lot of conversations. People want to chat to you. <laughs> you are, without question, the only person that I have interviewed that has depth in digital chemistry. Now, I know you cover all the ML side of things at Recursion, but just in case the audience isn't familiar, what is digital chemistry? So digital chemistry is a way of thinking about chemistry that kind of comes from the lens of machine learning, that comes from the lens of data science. Uh, not so much looking at individual compounds, individual molecules, but more so looking at large collections of compounds um, and seeing their relationships, trying to predict their properties, yeah. trying to identify which ones could have a property of interest, which ones might be uh, active or inactive. Um, and very much intertwined with the world of machine learning, with the world of AI. So how, I, I, you know, most folks think of a drug discovery process, they hear about trials, they know that it takes a really long time. Listening, I was actually doing my homework on you today, 90% of drugs in clinical trials fail to make it to the finish line and actually go out into the wild. On average, those cost $2 billion to create. The ones that do get approved and actually find their ways on their shelves or into our pharmacies. How is recursion, digital chemistry, and all of your efforts going to change that? Well, machine learning helps us understand more about the world. It helps us understand more about biology. So that when we do take that risk, when we do go through that grand experiment of a cl clinical trial, we're better equipped with knowledge of what that drug is doing, what that drug is doing to the system, what the drug is doing to the body, so that uh, we can make a more informed decision as what goes through. Right? Yeah. Uh, we like to talk about um, a funnel going from a V-shape into a T-shape. If we can rule out things faster that won't mm -hmm. succeed, we will be and enrich that pool of starting points, widen that pool of, of starting points, uh, we could be more selective. We can mm -hmm. look at the opportunities, look at the signals that we see within living systems, within cells, uh, see how the drugs impact the cells, to try to uh, really enrich that pool of starting points, decide uh, where are those therapeutic opportunities of interest that we want to dive in and that we want to make those commitments and which experiments we want to run down the road. In order to do this, you've got to be mapping an incredible amount of data. How much data, how are you doing that? How long does it take? I mean, I can only imagine the different factors within a single human cell that could affect the journey of one of these drugs or the impact on the human body. Yeah, um, a lot of data, petabytes of data. <laughs> <laughs> 50, I believe? Um, well, that's everything that we have access to at the moment. It's a um, lot. It's a lot. <laughs> 50 petabytes of data, but in it's a no sense, joke. Um, what we kind of found is that world of external data isn't always enough, right? The mm -hmm. world of external data uh, and the way that drug discoveries happened over the last uh, 20, 40 years has been very targeted. Uh, scientists have uh, created very specific assays, very mm -hmm. specific uh, experiments that they would run uh, just for one program at a time, for developing one drug at a time. And uh, those do exist, there's little pockets of information here or there, mm -hmm. but really at Recursion what we do is we challenge that to some extent, we generate data. So we revisit the experiments that get conducted that inform the drug discovery process. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than start with a particular therapeutic uh, area in mind and saying we want to develop this drug for this particular condition, we will start by creating these maps of biology. We will uh, uh, do, we have very interpretable, information rich and scalable assays um, specifically around uh, microscopy and taking images mm -hmm. of cells, images of cells having removed every gene one by one, 
uh, images of cells after having dosed that cells with new molecules, with new compounds, and look at how that changes the shape of the cell. Yeah. And that creates very um, information rich representations that we can start using to connect and start creating these bridges between uh, if you take these compounds and dose them into these disease models, uh, that may or may not have an effect. And yeah. we do that at many different levels. We do that not just with microscopy images of cells, but also with how these drugs and removing these genes affects uh, which DNA is active, uh, the transcripts we call them, um, which RNA is uh, being transcribed at, at a given point in time. Uh, so we look at creating these maps of high di dimensional re re uh, representations so that we can then use AI and, M and ML to look for, mine that for opportunities, mine that for those cases where we can you know, find those associations and, and really drive new programs. ML being like the smart explorer there, going over the new terrain or the unexplored land or the newly discovered island, I love it. It's a, it's a great visual to think about. You're not just, you describe that in such a digestible fashion, thank you. You're doing millions of these experiments per week in the lab, right? Yes. So by scaling the experiments that we run, we're at a point now where um, we couldn't basically ask any individual scientist to look at the output from a million different experiments and tell us what's happening at that level. Uh, we need the uh, we need vision transformers there mm -hmm. to look at the cells and tell us what's happening in the cells. Uh, we need um, uh, AI video tracking in order to see what's happening um, in our uh, mice as we're collecting data as as we're going through those uh, preclinical studies as well. Yeah. Um, so. In, in, in our sense, uh, data collection really is that strategy. We want to be able to collect more data, mm -hmm. uh, more data across a variety of different uh, areas of biology, and uh, AI is really the tactic in this situation. We don't really have the choice. We have to use AI because the amount of data that we generate is so abundant that we need a way to consume it. And yeah. it's our method of consumption yeah. for the data. With have the recent technological advantages, well, I would say not advantages, I mean, MLAI has been around for decades, but I feel like with the, the focused attention, uh, some companies putting out more compute than we've had before, are you able to realize this faster recently? Has this been a, a, a steady linear growth? How is, has the complexity gotten any easier to navigate as more and more people are pumping money into these types of systems and developing tools around this? Because I would imagine you're using quite a few different tools to bring all of this information together. Yeah, so um, access to compute is a big one. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have um, a lot of access to compute through cloud computing systems, uh, but also our own on-prem um, uh, uh, compute system. So we mm -hmm. have, um, uh, system internally we call BioHive, uh, over 500 of the uh, H100 GPUs wow. um, that we use to build these models, that we use to train new models, that we use to run inference on all, all, mm -hmm. all the images, uh, that we use to benchmark uh, models as well. Uh, we, it's also access to technologies that lower that barrier of development. So we're not developing all of, these, all of this code in a box, right? right. We have a lot more uh, code infrastructure there uh, through um, various, through through any scale, through mm -hmm. um, you know weights and biases, a lot of other platforms that that we tend to use, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that our uh, data scientists or um, digital chemists, if you yeah. will, yeah, yeah. Uh, can focus on building the models and uh, finding those new scientific models, those new ML models that solve those those biological questions without otherwise having to concern themselves with what kind of nodes are these running on? Right. Am I using the right compute? Am I you know, at capacity with my, my, my RAM? How does, uh, yeah. so uh, it, it really helps ab abstract those two problems away so our machine learning scientists can, can focus on that element. And do what they really want to do. Nobody wants to do stuff they, they're not passionate about and super excited about. They want it to work, and they want it to work as fast as possible. You mentioned AnyScale and Ray. 
What is it that they empower you to do that's so critical for you to continue to succeed? Um, really untangling that, right? So mm -hmm. we don't have to think as much about about that compute, right? Um, I've gone through that process long before uh, a lot of these tools existed where um, a new algorithm comes out and we needed to scale it up. At that point, it's not necessarily the, back then it wasn't the petabytes and you know, right. the, the right, hundreds right. of GPUs that we're talking about now, but like even in the earlier days of the cloud computing, it was you know, terabytes and um, you know, various uh, classical ML uh, technologies and other types of algorithmic ways to probe the data. Um, but when you scale things, it ends up being, it ends up being a massive game of whack-a-mole. Right. You go from bottleneck to bottleneck and saying, aha, I've, I'm, I'm CPU limited, I got to you know, figure out that problem. I'm you know, uh, memory limited, I got to figure out that problem. And in a sense, we spent a lot of time going through that process, probably more so than focusing on the science at the time, right? So yeah. being able to not think about that is itself um, yeah, really an accelerator. It's a really an accelerator to the research that we do. I can, I can imagine. Is, is the type of mapping that you're doing, I mean, I'm just thinking about 50 petabytes of data, we're talking about a lot of different things. Are you focused in any particular solutions where there's more overlap within the biology and the chemistry, like our biological systems and the chemistry? I mean, you're doing millions of experiments, but I'm wondering if, if, some, if some of these experiments are, are showing results quicker than others, depending on different solutions or drugs that you might be inventing. Are there any patterns here, I guess is what I'm saying, more simply? Well, or, that's what we need the machine learning yeah. to do, is to find <laughs> those patterns, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly, it, it yeah. is. I'm, I'm just wondering, are you, are, you, are you seeing patterns emerge now that will, say, help our families for the folks who are listening right now? Or, you know, how, how far away are we from realizing the amazing work you're doing? I'll phrase it that way. Oh, I mean, definitely. Um, so Recursion is um, uh, one of the companies with the largest portfolios at the moment of clinical assets. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lag phase associated with that. A lot of the uh, clinical trials going on now uh, come from those earlier days of, of the research. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the, uh, but ultimately, a lot of that was enabled by the compute, a lot of that was enabled by our ability to reconsider the scientific model for disease being, right? Like uh, looking at the cells and trying to perturb them in, in different ways. Yeah. Um, so, we definitely are seeing a lot more opportunities come up. We're seeing opportunities show up in spaces that uh, were unmet before, mm -hmm. right? By really yeah. mapping out the biology, we're not focusing on those classes of drugs within uh, like those medicines that uh, have been served in the past where those targets are very well known, where there is a lot of data, like these high data problems, but the better the machine learning gets, the more we can take those patterns from those, those successes and those highly served needs mm -hmm. and start pulling that out and extrapolating that down to new areas of biology. And so the machine learning is helping us kind of extend that further and further away. Yeah. Uh, so we can go into venture, uh, like untapped targets, go into new biology and, and have an idea and being able to progress there with confidence that we didn't have before. That confidence is also huge, especially when you're making these investments, we're trying to save lives. There's a lot of, a lot of passion and I can, I can only imagine your company was acquired a year and a half ago and you got to join this team, but you've been working on AI for drug discovery for nearly a decade at this point, <laughs> not, to, not to throw you under the bus age-wise, you don't like it. But I'm, I'm curious, what, what drove you to get started in this space? It's a challenging, gritty, data-heavy, heavily regulated arena. What was your catalyst as an entrepreneur to get into this world? Well, um, early on, um, so if we, if we were to rewind back to like 2013, 2014 time frame, uh, big data was really uh, what a lot of people were talking about. It was, oh yeah. There's a lot more information that's being made available 
uh, through public consortiums, through databases, through patents. And at the time, there was a lot of efforts there coming in and curating that, collecting that, creating yeah. these aggregate databases, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was happening in parallel with you know, the advancements of data science, uh, the, like, uh, the availability of tools to kind of probe that information as well. Uh, so really what, what attracted me to this, this particular space was um, when we do take a drug, we uh, design a drug for one specific purpose in mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we call it a, a target, um, a uh, biological target of interest, a protein. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal within drug discovery is to find a drug that uh, will disable, that will inactivate it or activate it, depending on, on the situation, yeah. as well as we can, right? Uh, and we go through that process of refining it until at some point we decide to put it into a living system. Mm -hmm. And that's the point where everything else afterwards is, well, is it doing what only what it was designed to do or is it doing something else, right? And that's the question that I wanted to answer at the time. It was, can we figure out everything that a drug is doing inside of a cell? Not just going in and designing it for one specific thing, but having mm -hmm. a broader understanding of is it doing something else that we don't want it to do? Right. Uh, could it be working in two ways that are simultaneously beneficial? So uh, really when we were looking at the, um, as a big data and that, uh, that first pass of machine learning to try to broaden that, that realm of uh, information, it was really about yeah. understanding, having a, a better bird's eye view of everything that a drug is doing to, to the system. And if we can solve that problem, then we can create you know, more like safer, more effective medicines. Absolutely, and solve more problems faster. We, we do learn so much about drugs that can do different things, or even on the other side, the side effects. We've all heard those commercials with a million mm. side effects listed that probably didn't come out until we were in that trial stage. Wow, all right, I have one more question for you, Stephen, because this has been fascinating. Obviously a lot of things moving right now, you're going at warp speed. What do you hope to be able to say when I sit down and interview you at Ray Summit next year that you can't quite say yet today? Okay, that was, a, <laughs> that was a nice twist. I, I mean, I got to give you some sort of surprise. You nailed all the other answers. I got to keep you on your toes, but this is good, you know? This could be anything, right? You can, you can take this question any direction you want to take it. All right. Um, one of the things that we're really looking to do is not just model all of the experiments that exist, but we're trying to come up with new experiments. We're mm -hmm. trying to discover new experiments that are only possible through the lens of AI. And, and really that's the driving bit uh, at the moment, right? So yeah. instead of just aggregating the world's data, uh, bringing it all together and, and running uh, uh, ML on it to try to find patterns, uh, it really is, can we determine what is that next wave of experiments that we didn't do in the past because we didn't have the ability to interpret them? Yeah. And if AI is able to surpass us and interpret things in new ways, yeah. Um, I really think that that is kind of a, a future vision that, that we all want to be driving towards. I love it. Well, we're in the car with you, Stephen. Thank you so much for taking the time. That's not a legal promise, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't worry. I forced him to say that. I forced him to say that. Thank you for coming all the way from Toronto. It's great to have you. Can't wait to have a discussion about that next year. And thank all of you for tuning in to our fantastic coverage here at Ray Summit by Any Scale. My name is Savannah Peterson in San Francisco. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for AI news.